Hello, everyone. Well, I hope every one of you is safe and sound along with your families. And so uh, this is going to be, I think, the, the last uh, lecture in this series of lecture. Uh, the last, of course, uh, I mean, recorded lecture before probably we move to real lecture, I hope, very soon in the amphitheater. So uh, we, it's going to be on the American Civil War again. And so we, uh, dis we covered uh, the period before the war. We spoke about the reasons, the causes of the war, and then we spoke a little bit about the war itself and the main events that took place in addition to the main figures, etc. Now I think it's uh, important and significant to speak about the uh, Reconstruction Era, what we call the... Re of course, as you know, uh, after every war, in the aftermath of every war, we have a Reconstruction Era. And this Reconstruction uh, Era, post-war period in, in the United States, um, conventionally speaking, and according to most historians, it's between uh, the end of the war, which means, of course, 1865, until 1877, and we will see why 1877 in particular. But uh, what I'd like to say in the beginning, before we speak about uh, the details of this Reconstruction era, we have to say that generally it is uh, assessed as being negative, as a failure, Mo mostly, I mean. Most historians agree that it was not really a successful Reconstruction era, which means that most of the objectives were not by the end. Uh, accomplished, and we will see why. Of course, we are speaking mainly about the issue of African American slavery and uh, the abolition of slavery that took place, of course, as we know, and uh, we have to remember that by the end of the of the Civil War, of course, there was the uh, Congress Amendment, Thirteenth Amendment uh, to the Constitution, and which abolished slavery uh, officially. But we will see why the Reconstruction was rather a failure. So, in general, it was divided between two periods, actually, uh, two phases, let's say. The, f the first phase was just two years, between 1865 and 1867, and then from 1877 to, uh, 67 to 1877. In the beginning, uh, the second phase was called the Radical Reconstruction, where... Uh, the Congress mainly. We are speaking mainly about a Reconstruction era that is read, led by by the Congress, and, and then the in the second phase, the Congress wanted to implement and to enforce uh, yeah. equality and the abolition, uh, etc. So in the beginning, by the way, we have to speak also about two presidents of the United States after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln that we spoke about. Then came the vice president, Lincoln's vice president, whose name was Andrew Johnson. It's probably also significant to speak a little bit about this man. This man was not, uh, did not belong to the same party uh, as uh, Abraham Lincoln. He, uh, he was a Democrat and he was rather from the South, not from the North. He was from North Carolina, which was part of the South in the war. And... Uh, Interestingly, uh, he was not. Uh, uh, he, he was a southerner, and he was from the south. But he did not leave the the Congress. He he was he belonged to the Confederacy officially, of course, and he was the only senator, the only congressman not to leave his office after the war started. Uh, this is, of course, a very significant historical detail that he was the only, I repeat, the only uh, congressman from the South who did not uh, leave his office and he continued and this is why we find him president after the death of, um, of Abraham Lincoln and this is very significant. So he was, uh, of, you remember when we spoke about three categories of states during the war, there were the, the free states, in the Union. There were also the seceded states, 11 of them, but there were also some states that were rather, we can call probably neutral, who uh, were at the same time slave, slave states. They, uh, they had slavery inside, but uh, they did not want to leave the Union. And among them, mainly Kentucky, for instance. But uh, this man also, although he was from the South, and he was probably pro-slavery, probably, I say, we will see later. But uh, he did not want to leave the Union because, of course, he believed in the Union. So 
Now, and during the first period, the first phase of the reconstruction era, uh, this man probably will cause some, some problems. And there will be some probably contention uh, between him and the Congress in terms of the enforcement of the, uh, the abolition of slavery. Well, uh, th this was the first part that is uh, very important. It's the character, the personality of this, uh, of this uh, president who served from 1865 to 1869. He was vice president, so he came to office not by election, but because of the assassination of Lincoln. And uh, also another important thing uh, during this period was the creation uh, since 1965 and before even the death of Lincoln, just a few months before the, the, de the assassination of the president, there was the creation of what we call the Freedman's Bu Freed Bureau, yes, the Freedman's Bureau. And this bureau actually, or office or department or institution, it was, it was called a bureau. And it was in charge of rather the implementation of the abolition of slavery. And it was in charge of helping the uh, former slaves to build a new life, helping them economically, logistically, socially, politically, etc. So that was uh, the uh, the, uh, the the mission of this bureau. But the uh, thing that was important here is that, uh, as I said, there would be probably a kind of... Uh, opposition between uh, the new president, Johnson, and Congress, in addition to the department that was created, this bureau that was created by by Congress. And uh, what we would say, and here, of course, you see, we have, this is why we have to remember that Andrew Johnson was from the South, and he was not really uh, totally against slavery. He was, for sure, we cannot say that I personally cannot say that he he was 100% for slavery, but of course we cannot say that he was against slavery. So he was probably in the middle between and betwixt. And during this period, there was contention. There there were a lot of troubles between the the institution of the presidency and the institution of Congress. And by by the way, something significant that happened also was the impeachment of this president because. He was uh, considered to be violating his uh, authority and abusing, uh, abusing his uh, authority. According to Congress, he was impeached, but he was not dismissed from office. And this is very significant also during this period between 65 and 69, as I said. Later, you have just because, since we speak, we're speaking about the presidency in 19, in 1869. Then a very interesting man came to office, and he was the most popular and the most important, probably general of the Civil War uh, figure, who was very important during the Civil War. And you remember him, I'm sure, his Ulysses Grant, who became also president of the United States af after Johnson. And here we could also see a radical change in the policies of the federal government. So, uh, as I said, during the first phase of the Reconstruction, again, there was a kind of wrestling between the President Andrew Johnson and Congress, and this wrestling was over, as I said, the implementation of the, uh, the abolition of slavery, but also the implementation of all those rights uh, that, uh, of course, Congress wanted to uh, to give uh, African Americans political rights, civil rights, etc. So uh, this was the the atmosphere in general. What we have to say, of course, af after the abolition of slavery by the Thirteenth Amendment to the Constitution, uh, people, African Americans, and also their supporters, of course, expected uh, to to have, of course, full political rights, but. What, what we have to say and what we have to know here from the very beginning, from, 16, from 1865 and after the assassination of Lincoln and after the end of the Civil War, right after the end of the Civil War, we have to know that nothing was smooth and the problems persisted, problems about the slave issue, but it became, of course, slavery was abolished officially, but now we will speak about the African-American issue. 
many of the states in the South try, tried to enact, because in the beginning they were allowed by Andrew Johnson, in the beginning, the very beginning, they were, these states in the South, they were allowed by Andrew Johnson to form their own councils and to, 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 to run the state again. Most of the figures of uh, the old figures of the Civil War in the South came back to office. Many of them came back to office uh, after the war. And then, uh, while respecting the abolition of slavery in the Constitution, they tried to create something else to, to continue the exploitation of African Americans, not in the name of slavery, but in, in the name of something else. Well, before the abolition of slavery in the South, there, uh, there was what used to be called the slave codes. Now they started to enact new laws and new regulations in the South that were known uh, by the name of black codes between 16, uh, 1865 again and 1867. The black codes, what are these black codes again? Now, with the abolition of slavery, they still persisted and they still maintained, they wanted to maintain a system of exploitation of African Americans in another crooked way, ways. So uh, in crooked ways, which means in tr trying to manipulate the law in order not to respect full equality between whites and blacks. These black codes, uh, of course, you can imagine because we spoke about such forms of exploitation, such forms of discrimination, segregation, etc. So these black codes, of course, uh, came to replace the slave codes, and they were their objective was mainly to uh, provide cheap labor because that was, of course, again one of the most important issues: the labor, uh, the labor force that, uh, of course, that African Americans represented. To their, so the, these black codes uh, actually were in the form of forced labor, discrimination, segregation, intimidation of black people. We I talked to you about the Ku, Ku Klux Klan, that terrorist organization that believed in white supremacy and which actually was very active by the late 1860s, assassinations and intimidations, etc., mob rules. But also in uh, uh, black codes meant also the conditioning of voting. You, you remember when we talked about putting conditions on voting, like literacy and um, property, ownership, uh, etc. Uh, also, um, for example, preventing these African Americans from their depriving them of their of their rights, like the right to hold arms, which is a constitutional right, by the way, in the United States, to hold arms, to have guns, that's a constitutional right. But one form of discrimination was to deprive African uh, Americans and to prevent them from holding uh, firearms. Also, uh, you can find it in terms of uh, testimonies in courts where African Americans did not have the right, for example, in some states to testify and to deliver their tes uh, testimonies in courts. There was also what they called, because we have to remember that African Americans, even though emancipated, liberated from slavery, they were poor. They were mostly illiterate, etc. So they were not really in a good position to defend their rights after the 13th Amendment. There was also a law that was called vagrancy law, vagrancy, which means uh, being homeless and living in the streets. And and this is, of course, uh, something that you expect African Am Americans to be in because, of course, they didn't have property. They, have, they had just been emancipated. They were slaves and they didn't have houses, lands, etc. And this is, a, by the way, the role of the uh, Free, Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, that, uh, it, it, the, the Bureau was expected to, to, to help them in this respect because they were, of course... Uh, homeless, uh, they were impecunious, etc. So uh, you see, with these new black codes, uh, there uh, the states in the south tried to probably to hamper the process of real emancipation because real emancipation, uh, actual emancipation, is not uh, something written in the constitution. It's something that should be achieved, that should be realized in the field. In reality and here we're going to see today in this lecture I'd like to talk to the most important thing that I'd like to talk about is the difference between theoretical laws legislations and reality in the field 
there's a big difference. You uh, people sometimes think that once they enact a law, for example, once they abolish slavery, it's over. The problem is over. No, not at all. There is a big difference between the law and reality. That's what we have in many instances. And in, we can take a lot of examples, for example, from Tunisia and the difference between the legislation, which is a very important thing, of course. It's a very important aspect of the cause of the issue. But there is a big gap between the legislation, which is there, and implementation, in the enforcement of that law. Most of the time in many countries, including Indonesia, they make a law, they enact a law, which is a big achievement, but you find nothing in the field, in reality, in implementation, there is nothing that happens. So this is very, and this is of course an example of this, the uh, concern in slave, uh, slavery and the abolition of slavery and how uh, by the end, of course, we have a system after the war, a system that is very similar to slavery. You could call it forced labor. By the way, concerning vagrancy law, I said it was a, a crime, and it's still a crime in many countries, to, to live in the streets, to be homeless, to be vagrant. But uh, I said that the problem of discrimination is that this law is going to be mainly imposed to African Americans because they were destitute and they were without property, without homes, etc., without money. So they were very vulnerable in this respect. And this is why uh, they were uh, punished by this law. And by the way, the punishment was mainly uh, la forced labor. A again, so they find themselves again working, I mean, without get being paid, without, having, without receiving decent salaries, etc. So again, in this atmosphere, as I said, there was a kind of contention between the president, Andrew Johnson, and Congress. And uh, by the way, historically, Andrew Johnson vetoed many of the bills passed by Congress. And uh, for example, one of the most important incident was when he vetoed the 14th Amendment. He was against the 14th Amendment. It, it, in general, he was not for full uh, rights for blacks. And and he was trying to help southern leaders, old southern leaders, to come back to office and to, again, not to really allow African Amer Americans to have full equality and full rights in, in general. So, but of course, Congress uh, persisted and tried to to pass. And of course, the proof is that by the end, there was we had, of course, the Fourteenth Amendment to the Constitution passed by Congress, and it's about equal protection. It's you can say that this this is very long, by the way, if you read it, as I I showed you the Constitution, the American Constitution last time, and 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 its uh, amendments. So. Uh, the 14th Amendment is a very long amendment. It speaks in detail about equality between all citizens and also it's supposed to be the article or the amendment that um, that actually granted uh, citizenship, American citizenship to African Americans. And uh, so just to show you the text, not, uh, I'm not going to read it. This is, well, you have... I don't know if you can see this. Well, you have the 13th Amendment, which is a short amendment, and the 14th Amendment, which is a very long amendment uh, with many sections in it, four, five, five sections in it, speaking about equal protection, and also it's a grant in, as I said, full citizenship to African American Americans without any, of course, distinction between uh, African Americans and other citizens. Again, women did not have the right to vote at that time, of course. And then came also the 15th Amendment, which was also about uh, equal voting rights. It, it granted voting rights to African Americans again. So uh, Andrew Johnson was against these, uh, these reforms. And uh, of course, he had rather, as I said, uh, a, a southern tendency to reject such, uh, such amendments and such uh, reforms. There was, uh, of course, a lot of tension between Congress and Andrew Johnson, and which led, as, as I said, to his impeachment. Well, uh, what we have uh, to say also that uh, during this time, uh, by the way, the 14th Amendment came only in 1868, a little bit late, so 
uh, equal protection in, in 1868, and then the 15th Amendment, get, uh, vote and rights, equal vote and rights, came in 1869, and uh, when uh, Ulysses Grant came to, to office. So uh, the struggle uh, led, the struggle between Congress and the president led now to a second phase of the Reconstruction, where Congress is going to, to have more power and to exercise more power in order to implement real uh, abolition and real equality, etc. Uh, well, uh, this... Uh, uh, the the, the, the cre uh, we had of course the Freedmen's Bureau, which, uh, as I said in the beginning, between 1865 and 1867, I believe it was not able to 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 play its role because of this, of course, struggle between president and and also because of the return of southern leaders to office and to Congress also, and. Uh, uh, the Bureau, as I said, uh, his, its mission was to oversee the emancipation of blacks and to oversee the implementation, the real implementation, the actual implementation of the abolition. Uh, but, of course, this was, as I said, uh, opposed by uh, Southerners, by the new Southern uh, governments uh, in the beginning, and then by also by the president. So this led to now... Uh, more force and more, uh, of course, uh, intervention by Congress. And in 1867, something very important happened because of this, because of this struggle. And it was the decision by the Congress now, because they, they found that it was not working this way, so they decided to divide the South into five military districts, military zones, five of so they, the, after this experience, for them that was a failure between 65 and 67. Now in, 60, in 1867, there was the Reconstruction Act, and which divided uh, the South into five military districts, uh, appointing generals from the North to rule these districts. But this decision, which was, as you can see, very radical, was uh, then changed, uh, and the following uh, year the states were readmitted. The following year, which means 1868, the the states uh, were readmitted to the Union again as states, but again with a lot of conditions. And uh, here we uh, in this now we start the second phase of the Reconstruction era, and we can see now uh, an important involvement of African Americans in politics in the South and in the North. And uh, during the, the second period mainly of the Reconstruction, 67 to 77, there you say there, there were about 16 congressmen uh, among African Americans. Uh, so 16 African Americans were in Congress, served in Congress, which is very, of course, significant in Congress. But also, of course, you can imagine that a lot of positions were occupied by African Americans, whether within the federal government or within also the, the states, uh, the councils, the states, sheriffs, uh, different uh, officials, uh, of course, also were uh, black Americans during this period. So we can see that the, there was a, uh, some change during this period, which was the, called the Radical Reconstruction from 67 to 77. Well, this is not going, of course, to last forever. We will see a backlash later, after uh, 16, uh, 18, uh, 1877. Sorry. So after speaking about this and after speaking about the radical reconstruction and the achievement of some of the goals of the Civil War and the uh, 13th Amendment, when, of course, as I said, a lot of African Americans served in different positions, whether in fe the federal government or in the state governments. And uh, there was, of course, uh, a kind of rise of uh, uh, civil rights uh, for African Americans. And they started, uh, of course, participating in political debates and, and also in uh, in elections, the first of, the first election, by the way, historically uh, that uh, uh, in which, of course, African Americans had the right to vote was in 1867. That's uh, remembered as the first vote, by the way, for African Americans, and which was a very historic, a very important historical event. But now, if we speak about the failure and the causes of the failure of the Reconstruction, so we said the first 
timid and weak phase of the reconstruction that did not achieve the, the goals. But then we speak about a radical phase, radical reconstruction phase, which led to some achievements. But then we will speak about uh, uh, a movement backward, if, if you want, a kind of uh, uh, recession. Why? Because why? We have to speak about the reasons why. So the, after mainly seven, 1877 that we speak about the end of the Reconstruction era, but also the failure of the Reconstruction era for many reasons. Well, the first reason that you already know, of course, and we spoke about this a lot, it's of course the resistance by white supremacists, of course, including the KKK, Ku Klux Klan, but of course, which was, of course, as I said, a terrorist organization intimidating blacks, assassinating them sometimes and engaging in violence. You have to imagine, of course, that atmosphere. This is very important in the absence of law enforcement. You, we are in the, uh, uh, of course, in the uh, 19th century. And so it was the reign of terror in uh, some way. But uh, in addition to that, there was also wide resistance and wide rejection of equal rights by general, by the general public, by, uh, by everyone, by most white people in the South, not only by terrorist organizations or politicians. Uh, some historians, for example, say that even Poor white Americans in the South rejected equal rights because they thought that equal rights and abolition of slavery and emancipation of blacks was against their interests in, uh, for example, in jobs, in employment, because, of course, these blacks are going to take their, their jobs, etc. In addition, of course, to, to probably uh, innate uh, racism, of course, that you, we all know about. And the belief that uh, the belief in the supremacy of white people, etc. So uh, these were some of the reasons: intimidation, violence, but also other reasons, including corruption. By the way, because uh, a lot of historical accounts speak about corruption inside the different institutions, including in, within the Freedmen's Bureau itself and corruption uh, that, uh, that also involved African-Americans themselves. Some African-American politicians and officials were engaged in corruption, and which, of course, gave a very bad impression, a very bad picture about this emancipation and these emancipate, emancipated politicians and people. Also, in addition to that, there was a very important economic crisis in the, during uh, the 1970s and the late 19, uh, 18, sorry, the late 1860s and the, and the 1970s, there was uh, a, a very uh, important economic crisis which led to more violence, led to more instability in politics, etc. And this uh, uh, economic crisis, of course, led people to think about the past, and uh, some people thought that probably we made a mistake by emancipating African Americans, and this led to all this chaos, etc. And uh, a kind of nostalgia to to the old uh, system and to the old uh, regime. So all these uh, reasons, of course, you can see. So uh, as we said, intimidation, violence, racism, white supremacy, corruption inside the different institutions in addition to the economic crisis, in addition to the resistance, of course, of white supremacists and that we talked about, including Andrew Johnson, by Andrew Johnson and a lot of politicians. So we can see here why this all this led to the failure of the Reconstruction era that was not really a success. And the main date was in 1877 that we could speak about probably the end of the Reconstruction era. Why? You know, in politics, when a political party doesn't really succeed in its mission and it is replaced by the other party. We speak about the reign of the Republican Party in, from 1865 to 1877. The Republicans were the rulers in the South. They were supported by African Americans, and in the North they were dominant. But now, in 1877, what happened was the victory of the Democrats. Now, 
uh, in the elections and this marked the end of the reconstruction era people returned to the democrats and also they returned to more probably uh, belief in supremacy in white supremacy etc so now uh, it ends as we said by uh, 1877 with the victory of the democrats in the elections and uh, here uh, we uh, this was a turning point in history according to most historians there was also a very important uh, legislation that was enacted before 1877 it was in 1872 and it was the amnesty act amnesty the pardon act it was called the amnesty act of 1872 and this act uh, of course uh, by congress was uh, for uh, to, uh, gave or let's say restored political rights to uh, most leaders of the south now because in the beginning by andrew Jen johnson of course it was mainly temporary but also it was not for all leaders of the south and planters mainly big business people big owners of the lands etc now we're in 1872 there was emancip not emancipation sorry there was amnesty for all of these and which meant of course uh, giving them back restoring uh, their political rights and mainly to uh, so they had the right to engage in politics and to run for offices again and this probably what led of course to their victory the victory of the democrats in 1877 even the congress so after during this period in the 1870s even congressmen started to to probably feel uh disillusioned with the issue of emancipation many of them were very strong supporters of emancipation and abolition uh, many of these started to lose trust, to lose confidence in this dream of emancipation and prosperity of the land, etc. And so this led again, as I said, to a kind of uh, backward movement to, towards, of course, more segregation and discrimination. Now, after 1877, of course, you know in general what would happen. Of course, there will be more return to discrimination to segregation to assassinations by the kkk etc and what uh, was called at that time the jim crow laws as we said jim crow j i m c r o w jim crow's jim crow laws and uh, these laws of course mainly like the black coats that we spoke about but these were even harsher the Jim Crow laws were, were of course, law, laws enacted by uh, Southern legislations, legislatures uh, against the blacks, and they uh, mainly, of course, uh, meant to, to, to um, let's say, to impose more discrimination and to prevent blacks from enjoying their political rights, etc. This is mainly the atmosphere that we have by the late 19th century. Well, uh, the, the African-American cause from this period uh, until the 1960s, of course, had to, African-Americans had to, uh, of course, to endure all the injustices and all these uh, forms of discrimination and segregation. They, this cause, the African-American cause, had to wait until the 1960s to be fought again by, of course, the famous names that you know, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad, etc., in the 1960s to fight again for their rights. So they had to wait, of course, all these decades to fight again for their rights, for equality, for equal rights, for political rights, for civil rights in what we call in the 1960s in the U.S. the civil rights movement. Well, in conclusion, if I uh, may conclude here, after uh, what, uh, talking about what we call the failure of the Reconstruction Era, by the way, we can say era or era, uh, we can say here the most important lesson, as I said in the beginning, was that there is a big gap, a big difference between the enactment of a law and the implementation of that law the enactment of a law and the enforcement of the law. There is a big difference. And this is not only in this case, this is a, one of the best cases to, that, to show you the, the gap between a law in theory, in the text, and its implementation in reality. And you see it takes many decades, in this case mainly, it takes many decades to be implemented in reality. Uh, uh, but 
still, uh, my conclusion is it, uh, it, it's that it, the laws and the amendments to the Constitution, 13th, 14th, 15th, are still, were still important, very significant and important. They are there in the Constitution, although they were not implemented immediately, they were not respected immediately, but the act of having them in the Constitution itself is very positive and very important, and they will be revived later, and they will be reused later in the 1960s. This was extremely important, and it's a, an extremely important lesson about laws and their enforcement and, and you can take a lot of examples, by the way, in the end, let me say this, you can take a lot of examples of this in Tunisia, for example, in the Tunisian law, how uh, you see a lot of gaps and differences and a lot between the, the law itself and what you have in reality, the law itself and what the courts are deciding on a daily basis. And because the law, in order to be respected in society, by the courts and by society and by law enforcement, it needs also, it, it, you, you, don't, you don't just need a law in the text, in the constitution. You also need to change the mentality, you need to change the mindset, you need to change the culture. So this is, of course, what uh, you have to do after enacting a law, after making a law. What you have to do is to work on culture, is to work on the mindset in order to make that law concretized. Thank you very much.